So all of the work that we do, we situate within a comprehensive, integrated, three-tiered model of prevention. And this is a, a multi-tiered system, just like if you are using PBIS in your context, you are using RTI, you are using MTSS, all of those apply a similar tiered logic. What's unique about CI3T is that it is um, one model that addresses students' academic, behavioral, and social emotional learning needs um, within one integrated model. And we'll show you um, some examples of that integration as we move through the night. But we're really thinking about that strong primary prevention for all kids. So we provide um, the foundation for students to be successful in our schools, and also for those who need more intensive interventions to be able to be supported in that general context when they learn the new skills and come back and are in their um, general peer groups for most of their instructional day. We would love for you to follow us. We have um, work on screening that we are disseminating. So if you are interested in systematic screening on behavior, we have lots of information um, there as well as lots of resources for your own professional learning for both building your own comprehensive um, model and for implementing it through the year. There's also a wealth of resources to promote professional learning with your, um, with your teachers. And it's a very exciting year to actually be following us on social media because we will um, be sending out reminders and links and lots of information. We have an entire suite of tools that will be released on June 24th that will be available for you. So we're, we're super excited about um, the sort of like updated science behind them, the examples. We learned a lot over the last few years from teachers and these materials were really created based on that learning. Um, so please do follow us if you are on these different platforms. Um, this is the website where you received uh, access to tonight's um, presentation. Kathleen walked you through that at the beginning, but it is ci3t.org. If you're joining us a little bit after that, go to the professional learning tab that's um, highlighted here in red, go to Project Empower, and then the second, um, the second, you'll see the second page here. The flyer at the top that almost looks like a Word document is where you can click and register for the final session if you're interested in, in that. And then below it, if you click the plus on any of these um, orange salmon, I don't know what you want to call them, um, bars, you can click on that. And then all the materials and resources are there for you to download and use um, as you like in your own work. All right. Those are, the, those are the logistics, and now we're going to get into the actual agenda for today. So really, we just want to welcome you, um, situate the context, and then we're going to be talking tonight about um, Tier 3 interventions that are both data-informed um, and proactive positive interventions so that you can support success for students. We're going to use two illustrations. We're going to share first about acting out behaviors, um, looking at the acting out cycle and how we can intervene as early as possible to support um, students. And then we're also going to talk about supporting students with internalizing concerns. And then we're going to um, wrap that up and move forward. All right. So what we want to share with you is that this work is, um, is not new. It's been around since 1997 with Kathleen. And I, I picture her with uh, one of those little plastic boxes with the handle, sort of like carrying materials into a school. Those of you who've been around for a long time, you know what I mean. Um, and starting in that one room with one, one teacher, one school, and really thinking deeply about this work and what it meant in a school context for people doing this work every day, and then really scaling that across. So bringing that into um, multiple regions of the U.S. So all of these pins represent um, districts and states that are um, using uh, CI3T models in their schools and specifically schools that we have worked with in this process. So we've learned a lot over this journey. We hope that you see that and the resources that we'll share with you tonight. This is the work that we've been doing over the last couple of years and what is supporting this, um, uh, this gathering tonight. We have worked um, in the last few years with leadership teams, with teachers around what they need to be most effective in implementing tiered prevention models. Um, we 
worked with them on the topics of different um, different types of professional learning materials that they needed to be on demand and accessible and usable in their school context for a range of stakeholders. So to use with families, with administrators, teachers, and so forth. We then spent um, two years testing and developing these materials with schools and school leaders and school teams. Now we're in the process of doing a randomized control trial with schools, comparing traditional practices with these enhanced practices that we've built over time. Um, and we're super excited because these will be released to everyone at the end of this year. But right now we're using, tonight we're sharing the traditional materials until those are ready. Um, but please do again, follow us for access to those. Welcome. So glad to see so many folks here. Again, my name's Grant. And we're going to take a moment to kind of look at some of the, some of the building blocks here. So taking a look and situating uh, tertiary tier three interventions within CI3T models of prevention and thinking about things from a data-informed uh, decision-making framework. So as Wendy mentioned uh, earlier, uh, this is sort of a nice visualization of the work that we do within CI3T. Um, it is uh, a tiered uh, system, a sort of broadening of MTSS uh, to include social, emotional uh, well-being through social skills curriculum. Uh, within CI3T, we look at academics and behavioral supports through uh, positive behavior interventions and supports framework. And um, this is, a, it's, an, it's a tiered model. So we're looking at providing support for all kids in our schools um, at the tier one level, what we do universally, and uh, tier two and tier three as, as additive supports for kids who may need a little bit extra beyond what tier one has in place. So uh, we're talking, you know, a validated uh, reading curricula, math curricula, PBS framework, and uh, an evidence-based social emotional curriculum to help teach these uh, these strategies. So this tier one is really uh, an, an important focus of, within the model. Now, you might be asking yourself, you know, I, I came to hear about tier three interventions. Why is Grant talking about tier one? Well, let me allay your concerns for a moment. Uh, tier one is really important because this serves as the foundational aspect upon which tier two and tier three is built. You know, if you're working with a kid to develop a, an, an intervention plan, uh, an individualized support plan for a kid, and they're working on things like, you know, calming strategies and bubble breathing and positive self-talk, and you're teaching them all these skills that they need to be successful, and you let them go into a classroom and it's total chaos... We're not setting those kids up for success. So the idea is that we want to have tier one in place, a, a solid foundation that all kids are receiving across academic instruction, behavioral supports, and social emotional well-being to really have a strong foundation to build additive supports uh, on top of those. And we do that through, uh, through developing a CI3T implementation manual. This is where school teams come together and they communicate with their, their school communities um, families and students to develop uh, a plan for teaching kids across these tiers. Um, and some things that we consider and keep in mind are, are these the academics, the behavior, and the social emotional uh, well-being. So as we're looking at instruction and in academics, we want to describe specifically what are we teaching, how much are we teaching it, when is it getting taught, and how do we make sure that those uh, that we're presenting this curriculum in a way that's really engaging for kids in ways that increases uh, engagement and minimizes disruption, such as some of these uh, strategies that you see here with like maybe opportunities to respond uh, using instructional choice and using a, a nice healthy dose of behavior specific praise and pre-correction and active supervision to, uh, you know, to reinforce the behaviors that we're seeing with that. For, for behavior, we wanna make sure that we're describing clearly that we're implementing our PBIS uh, framework with fidelity. And when we come across challenging behaviors that we're gonna respond to that in a way that's positive, that is professional, and that takes an instructive approach to looking at behavior. So we're not looking at, you know, a thousand and one ways to punish a kid, but it's like, how do we provide kids with the instruction that they're gonna need uh, so they can make better choices in the future? And we can do that through developing um, and implementing our six-step approach to supporting behavior in a, in a nice reactive plan to give teachers the skills they need to react efficiently to those types of things. And, you know, outlining what we're going to do for social emotional uh, well-being, what kind of curriculum we're teaching, when is it getting taught, for how, how long are we teaching it for, 
something like second step or, you know, positive action or harmony, things that we as a school community can help to develop and support for, for those kids. And we're outlining plans to teach this whole thing for everyone in our school community. Everyone's going to be, have a role to play in teaching expectations, reinforcing expectations, recognizing when kids are using social skills. Every adult in the building can help out with this. And we want to have plans for supporting those who are engaging in the plan and for students to participate as well through our ways of that we reinforce behavior. Again, for all kids at Tier 1 and thinking about how we can reinforce those behaviors and taking that time to ensure that we've got plans um, in place for monitoring um, uh, monitoring the plan to ensure that it's un unfolding as we intend. And some ways that we can help with the integration piece, because uh, you may recall that the I in CF3T stands for integrated. We have this integrated lesson plan uh, that we've got on our website to kind of help folks think about ways to do this. So as you're looking at things like, you know, I need to teach kids, uh, oh, I don't know, long division, for example. Well, you know, you could use this as a way to help not only outline those academic objectives, but like um, what sort of social skills do you want kids to be um, demonstrating during this lesson as well. What are the behavioral expectations? And if you've got objectives for those, you have targets that you can help support kids in meeting. And we can think about those low intensity strategies to help us to support that even further. So not just looking at behavior and academics and social emotional well being in sort of in silos, but like, you know, how do I integrate behavioral supports as students are working independently on these problems? So we're developing things in a more academic or more uh, integrated uh, fashion. And of course, we want to consider the ways that uh, we're reviewing and looking at information and data to help kind of monitor our, our plan. Uh, things like looking at social validity. Again, this is at tier one to see how well folks are um, finding our tier one plan to be acceptable in terms of the procedures, goals, uh, and outcomes. What about treatment integrity? How well are folks implementing uh, this school-wide plan. And if it's going well, great. And if it's not, well, we can problem solve that and figure out uh, what we need to do. And this is, of course, in addition to looking at our student-based uh, measures with academic and behavioral screening. And, you know, this here, this right here, this little snapshot of these data sources are going to be the thing that's going to drive us to look at what we're doing and what we need to change and what we might need to adjust to help kids out. You know, with data informed decision making is the cornerstone of, of CI3T. If you think about one of those, you know, old timey trains, instead of shoveling coal into the engine, you're shoveling data into there because that's what's going to drive us moving forward. So oops, that's the wrong button. There we go. And so when we're confident that we've got, you know, tier tier one in place with fidelity and it's working, we can think about our our additive approaches at tier two and our, our additive interventions at tier three. And, you know, one way to do that to, to look at and see if we have tier two and tier three in place would be to look at things like our screening data. So this is an example of, of what it might look like for a school that's been implementing CI3T for some time. We collect this information and we want to look sort of longitudinally um, across across time to see how well are students faring within our schools? Are, are, are students responding to our efforts? Are things going well? And if things aren't going well, like, you know, if you're looking at these data uh, in the winter of 2019, you might notice a little dip there. And that's good information to know because then you can respond to that and say, okay, what can we adjust to help our kids out uh, with these externalizing challenges or even with, you know, internalizing issues as well? We can look at this. So, I mean, these data sources are going to help us to ensure that we've got tier one in place, um, that it's happening with fidelity and that our kids are responding it to it in a way that, you know, we find beneficial and that they find beneficial as well. Um, so with those pieces in place, once we have a nice solid foundation for all kids that they're experiencing, um, then we can really think about, okay, so for our kids that do need um, additional supports at tier three, what does that look like? And, you know, to be clear, this, this tier one experience is going to be great for most of our kids, but we shouldn't really expect that that's going to serve every kid's needs. And that's not a tragedy. That's just kind of how populations of human beings work. People have different needs and that's okay. We just have to be ready to uh, find those needs and respond in ways that are evidence-based and effective. 
And so this is where tier three comes in for those kids that have the most intense and the most individualized needs. So when we begin looking at tier three, one of the things we can think of first is, okay, what do we have at our disposal? What do we have within a, a our library of tiered supports? When schools and teams build out our implementation manuals, uh, we build in uh, a list, a library at the end of our manuals to say, okay, if you got kids with tier two needs, here is everything that you have at your disposal. Here's everything you've got in your toolbox to try to problem solve and work with these kids to try to support them in academics, behavior, or social, emotional well-being. Same thing for tier three. What do we have sort of in our library? And so this would be a, a great place to begin sort of reflecting, see what, what we've got on what we've got on offer. Um, on our website, on the professional learning tab, we've got um, uh, some information about, you know, how to support kids in developing an individualized de-escalation support plan for kids with acting out challenges. And we'll be talking about that um, in just a moment. But um, so, okay, with that being said, so we're gonna take a moment now and we're gonna dive into the, the content of tier three. Thank you so much, um, Grant, for setting us up so nicely with a really strong um, context of tier one, right? C tier one is essential to have in place and to, um, focus on so that we can um, be supporting student, the, the students that really need those um, additional supports at tier two and tier three. Sometimes we wanna start at tier three and then we actually um, are not able to serve all of the kids that we should because we don't have tier one in place. So it's appreciated. So this is an example um, of what Grant was just talking about. So he was talking about the tier three intervention grid, and that's part of your overall CI3T plan where you list all of the strategies and supports that you have in place in school that you know you can deliver with fidelity because you've provided um, the resources to your school community and also the professional um, le learning to make sure that you're able to implement that. So this is one of them that we're going to talk about tonight, and it is that individualized de-escalation plan. So this, this just allows you at a glance for teachers to be able to see the description of what that means, the school-wide data that are being used to determine whether a student might be um, a good fit for this intervention, and then also how to monitor that progress, including assessing treatment fidelity or treatment integrity and also social validity. What do people think about this intervention? Is this working for kids and for teachers? Um, and then an exit criteria, because when we move kids into interventions, we want to make sure we're mindful of the goals that they're trying to meet so that they can move back seamlessly into tier one or tier two um, instruction. All right, so let's jump in. So what we know about um, de-escalation strategies is that if we can get what we call in front of the behavior, then we are most likely to have a more successful impact with kids. And so when we think about the three-term contingency of behavior, right, the B we know is the behavior and we're all really clear on what those behaviors are. Um, the C is the consequence. So anything that occurs after that behavior, um, it could be something like behavior-specific praise if it's following a behavior that um, we want kids to do more often, or it might be some sort of like separation from a group to um, work independently or some other consequence um, because of that. And I always think about preschoolers sitting in circle time and kids being moved to a table to be able to sit because they're kind of fidgety or um, getting their neighbors off task. That is a consequence. Um, so really where we want to be focusing our efforts is on the A. The A are the antecedents. And those are the things that we can do preventatively to set kids up for success. Um, and that feels better for kids, it feels better for us, and it prevents some of those more um, intense behaviors from actually ever occurring. So these are things like pre-correction, right? Pre-correction is a low intensity strategy that you can use to, to let students know what the expectations for success are in that environment or in that activity before they begin. And then it sets you up for looking for the kids that are following those expectations and being able to deliver, deliver some behavior-specific praise, letting them know when you've met them. So those are the early kinds of strategies that we want to talk about tonight in preventing more escalated kinds of behavior. 
We know that managing acting out behavior is one of the biggest challenges for educators. They tell us over and over again that they don't feel as prepared in that area as some of the other academic instructional areas in schools. We know that kids are coming to us with lots of diverse experiences. Um, and so we need to be ready with lots of strategies and be expecting different kinds of learner variants in our groups. We also know that um, for those people who say, yes, but supporting kids with really intensive behavior is um, the job of special educators, I would say yes, and also general educators, because we know that about 20% of our kids have mild to severe forms of behavioral um, and well being concerns. 12% of those have intensive needs. And then only 1% are really served by general education, are only served by special education, meaning most of those students are being served in um, classrooms by general educators. So everyone needs the ways to understand behavior and support kids um, preventatively. This is the acting out cycle, these seven stages that we're gonna talk about tonight. We wanna talk about what they look like. We wanna talk about practices that we can use to support kids when we see them um, in one of those stages. And we're also gonna talk about things like safety and then respectful recovery when students actually um, do get to the point where they have that escalated behavior. Um, the acting out cycle um, has a, a module in the IRIS Center. So if you are familiar with the IRIS Center, um, we would encourage you to use that as an additional resource. Um, our very own Kathleen Lane, you will see her, her head and voice and um, video on there as well. So we've got um, her expertise in both of these spaces, which is really nice. Um, when you download this presentation, it is linked. So you can go directly there through that link. Um, the way that we talk about and think about this as well is based on the work of uh, Jeff Colvin and Terry Scott. And so this book in the um, corner is a really good resource to go deeper if you wanted to do a book study with your faculty, um, for example. All right. What's really important about thinking about escalating behavior is the way that we respond is um, predicts how that cycle will go. So we can interrupt that cycle, we can redirect, or we can make it worse and actually make that behavior um, more difficult and more traumatic for that student. When we think about behavior, we think about it in a chain. And so each, each behavior and each stain gives momentum to the next stage to happen unless something happens for that chain to break. And what how we can break that chain, if you will, metaphorically, is by intervening, redirecting, using some of the positive, proactive, antecedent-based strategies that we're gonna talk about. We also know that behavioral momentum actually um, uh, is what inspires each one of those behaviors to escalate to the next stage if they are not interrupted. But we can also think about behavioral momentum um, for helping kids do things that they might be um, somewhat resistant to. So the high probability request sequences is a very simple strategy that you can use where you actually give students choices um, or give students directives of things that they should do that you know they're likely to comply with. So it might be something simple um, uh, like get out your pencil, you know, put it on the top of your table, something really simple. And then you're saying, okay, everybody pick up your pencils, they hold them in the air, and then they begin to write. So you're kind of building that behavior. If you think of like, Simon says, um, you know, that is one of those, like, even when Simon doesn't say we continue to do the behavior, because we have the momentum of doing it, and it helps us uh, move into that next situation. So behavioral momentum, just understanding um, both sides of it is um, helpful for understanding how to interrupt it, and also how to get kids to, um, to do those behaviors that we need them to engage in academically. All right, so let's look at some of these phases. All right, we're going to start with, oh, uh-oh, am I going backwards? I apologize. I went no, you're right where you need to be. I went, <laughs> went in the reverse. Okay. First day with a mouse, apparently. 
Okay, so we're going to start in the first stage. And the first stage is calm. And this is what we all hope for. We all hope that the day starts this way or that throughout the day that this is really what's happening in the classroom. And for the majority of kids, this is where they are, right? And so they're academically engaged in the work that we're doing. They're following the expectations, ideally, that we've posted and that we've uh, taught and that we're revisiting through pre-correction. They're also pretty responsive when we're giving them feedback and redirection and also praise. Um, and they're initiating those interactions with their peers in positive ways. They're goal-directed. They are doing essentially what, um, what is productive in the classroom for their learning. Okay, that sounds good. Thumbs up. Yeah. Everybody's like, yes, that's why I went into teaching. Okay. And so when that's happening, what we are going to be doing is we're going to be implementing our plan. So we're going to be implementing our school-wide CI3T plan. We're going to be varying our instructional delivery so that we keep kids engaged in um, the learning. We're going to be using praise to continue to promote and um, increase the behaviors that we want to see. And we are also going to be using low intensity strategies. So those strategies um, that I know someone's going to drop into the chat probably um, are those that we can use just to keep kids engaged in instruction. Things like instructional choice, increased opportunities to respond. So there's active participation. Um, we know with students, if we have a lot of wait time or downtime, that's when they will find something else to do. It's not always what we would like for them to be doing in a classroom. So we really want to make sure we have that really engaging learning environment. And then we're going to make sure that, you know, our classroom in general is set up for success for kids. Kids are safe um, and that we have really clear uh, procedures and routines that we follow. Now, sometimes during that calm phase, something will happen and it is what we call a trigger. And when students' behaviors are, they feel triggered, then we start to see that little bit of escalation in the behavior. So the trigger is going to be um, when we see them re respond to something. So we're looking at, um, you know, them responding to a potential conflict, it might be a person that enters the room. We have changes in routines for kids that have more chaotic um, environments in their life or not a lot of control over the you know, their lives and their choices, we see changes in routine really being triggering. We also think about peers. Sometimes peers come in in bad moods or they've got something they're trying to resolve and it, it brings it into the classroom. So all kinds of different things we're thinking about in the school environment. And we also have students that are coming to us already triggered in the morning, already on heightened alert um, because of other things that might be happening at home. It might be nutrition wise lack of sleep. Um, there's lots of stress going on in the environment. We know through social media and television, lots of information that even our littlest ones are being affected by. All of those things can increase um, the way that students are behaving in classroom. What we want to do here is we want to redirect. So we want to make sure that we're noticing when kids are being um, are being triggered by something and we're intervening as quickly as we can. So this is a really good opportunity as soon as you see it to do something. So we might reestablish um, the expectation through using pre-correction again. We might specifically ask that student to help us model it for others, right? Like really thinking about engaging those um, particular students. We also wanna make sure that we're always teaching students how to manage their own anger, um, how to engage productively in social skills. As Grant said earlier, we're doing that at tier one. So we're teaching these skills when students are in that calm phase. So when we start to see um, them get a little bit um, uh, more agitated, then we can um, intervene quickly. We also want to be communicating with families about things um, that might be happening at school so that we can meet students at the door and have uh, usher them into class in a really healthy, productive way. So these are um, the low intensity strategies. If you again, go to the CI3T website under professional learning, you will see an entire library unfold before your eyes, just like that, um, of these low intensity strategies. So things like active supervision, uh, pre-correction, um, instructional feedback. This one is instructional choice. And there's um, multiple, um, uh, resources that are available for you to download. They are all editable. So if you want to 
um, change them in some way, change the examples to be specific for your school, you can edit or change those um, in any way that you would like. So those are available free access for you to use as you would like. Now, if you go to a page that we are still calling, calling Responding to COVID-19, um, we have a wealth of resources there. And these were really built when kids were transitioning um, out of school, more home connected, virtual schooling, working on packets, whatever it is your community did on that moment um, to be able to stay connected with kids. So we have lots of resources that you can share with families um, that are available on there for using those low intensity strategies. You can use them in virtual environments, in the classroom environment, or in the home environment. All right. Now, if you go to literature and you want to learn more or have um, some kind of engaging discussion or book study with your faculty or staff or others, um, these are all available to use. Um, this preventing school issue uh, or preventing school failure issue is actually a free access issue. So you can click on it with the link and be able to download um, and use all of those. It's not behind any sort of paywall or university system. Okay, so now we have missed the opportunity when kids were triggered um, and now kids are starting to get agitated. And so what does that look like? And for some kids, it means that behavior is increasing, becoming more escalated or externalizing, and some kids will start to pull inward, right? So some kids will put their head down. Um, you will see that they start to withdraw. They have physical symptoms of really feeling agitated. Um, and so we want to be mindful of what it looks like when a particular student that we're concerned about starts to get agitated and pick up on what those signs are. When we find those, then we want to always, 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 when we have kids who are experiencing levels of anxiety or um, acting out kinds of behaviors, we need to recognize that they are in emotional distress. And so we want to be showing empathy. That is always our first place. Try, seek to understand what is causing them. Show them that you see that they're in some sort of distress and that you are there to help them navigate through that big feeling um, so that they can have a productive outcome that hopefully doesn't continue um, up the chain. It's helpful to give options that are calm, that are things that students can do so that they feel like they have some sense of control. Um, and then also when you offer a choice, make sure you give them a moment to make the decision. So you are not going to offer a choice and be like standing over them because you're just going to be increasing their, um, their uh, feelings of distress. And you might walk away. You might say, here are two options. I want you to choose one of these two things. I'm going to be back in just a minute to see what you selected. And then you're going to probably provide some behavior-specific praise for other students who are kind of on track and doing what you hope they will do as a model. And then you're going to go back and help them engage in that activity. Again, you're trying to interrupt. All right, so we're going to look at this example. This is an example of a teacher handling, or actually a non-example of a teacher um, responding to a student who is showing signs of agitation. Remember, you can use your notes on this math sheet. You'll have 30 minutes, and then I'll collect your work. Any questions? Michael, it's time to get started on your math sheet. Michael, it's time to get started, okay? Otherwise, you're going to run out of time. I don't care. Michael, your choice is to do your math sheet now, or you're going to have to do a makeup. Whatever, I'm not doing it. Okay. Um... In a, an unfortunate outcome for the behavior, um, right? Because maybe the teacher wasn't recognizing um, that the student was um, in that mindset. So what I would love for you to do in the chat, if you don't mind, is we're going to be silent for just um, probably 10 or 15 seconds. But I would love for you to put in a few things that you think the teacher maybe could have done differently. So what did the teacher do that you would think mm, that maybe wasn't the best choice? What did you see the teacher doing?
Oh, absolutely. Touching the student. We don't want to touch students who, I mean, generally, but certainly not, not those in distress. Okay. And dressing him in front of the whole class. Absolutely. Right. When we are making it big and loud for everyone, we're actually putting students in a place where they have to choose whether to be embarrassed or whether to, you know, react in front of that teacher. Yes, calling him out, physical space, right, right, perfect, okay, all right, thank you for those, okay, now let's watch and see the ways that you think that maybe she does it a little bit differently and hopefully a little bit more productively. <clears throat> You'll have 30 minutes and then I'll, I'll collect your work. Any questions? Michael, it's time for math. Are you doing okay? Listen, why don't you take a minute and I'll be back shortly. Okay, so thanks for putting um, some ideas in there. She showed empathy, it was calm. The entire situation just felt like it was recoverable by the way that she handled it, right? She got down to his level. So that left all the peers out from kind of getting involved in that, gave him some space and some time, yeah. And I love, exactly, Carrie, thank you. I love the way she modeled at the end. She almost was building momentum. Like he got his head up. She had the pencil in the writing position so he could just continue it going. Um, so kind of a little example of that. All right, really great ideas. Thank you so much for um, contributing those. Now, if we went with the first non-example, we've missed the opportunity to get in front of the behavior, right? And now we're at that escalation stage. And the way that we unpack these stages make it sound like they're these really discrete times. Sometimes you go from calm to escalation in a, in a blink of an eye, right? Um, so sometimes it takes a couple of times of really observing, having others observe um, to see what's happening in a place where you might intervene. Um, more swiftly or earlier in the situation. But when we are at that acceleration stage, we have argumentative behavior, non-compliant behavior, off task, right? All of these things that are the behaviors that end up um, resulting in office discipline for referrals, right? Teachers start to feel this um, sense of, you know, disrespect by the child's behavior. And we've really missed an opportunity to be productive earlier on. However, we're obviously always going um, to try and intervene. So at this, at this stage, we haven't quite hit the peak yet. So we still do have a way to be able to um, provide a safe environment to stu for students to intervene to hopefully get them back to calm. So we are going to be really cautious with the way we use our own behavior and our own, our words, our, phys our physicality, the way that we engage the group, right? So a lot of you commented on like the whole group is involved, you're yelling across the classroom. Um, so really being, a, being mindful of your own behavior and then really thinking about the, a non-threatening way to approach students. One thing I would say that is that if you're getting down on their level, right, where they're eye to eye, so you're not a threat, you're not leaning over them, make sure that you are a, a distance away that is safe for both the teacher and the students, because I've seen that go bad a number of times. So we really want to be thinking about the teachers maintaining their safety, the safety of other students, as well as, um, um, as, well as the students that are um, in crisis. All right, so let's look at this one and see how even at that acceleration stage, we might be able to do something differently. 
So here's the non-example. And if you'll continue to put ideas in the chat um, about what you're seeing, that would be fantastic. Caleb, cool it. Okay, everyone, I need you to get your papers out from yesterday. Those need to be on your desk. Caleb, if you do not have yours out, that will be a zero for this assignment. Caleb, I am not gonna play these games with you today. Pick up the paper or go to the office. Pick it up. Caleb, I don't know what your problem is, but you will not be disruptive in my class. Do you understand what I'm saying? What y'all looking at? That's it. To the office. And Oops. Okay. And then we have lost Caleb, right? So we've lost, we've deteriorated the relationship with Caleb. He's lost the learning opportunity. All the other kids in the class are a little bit anxious now as well after watching that happen. And now we have to think about how to support um, Caleb in a respectful way on re-entering the classroom. What's always challenging to me in watching that is the opportunity she missed when she at, when he balled up the paper and threw it down and she asked him to pick it up and he did. And then she still kind of um, was antagonizing them. So someone put in there, exactly. She never gave him a chance. It was her behavior that escalated him as soon as she called him out. Now, I showed this video um, about two weeks ago to a group of teachers and the preschool teacher said, does that really happen? And all the high school teachers in the class, in the class started to laugh. Um, and so unfortunately, this is a scenario that's been presented to us, but this is the reality of sometimes what's happened in classrooms. I think what it tells us is that teachers are also stressed, that they need better tools to be able to support kids and being able to identify um, when those behaviors are happening and really ways to start with empathy. All right, now let's watch this in a little bit different of a perspective or approach. Find the button. Hey everybody, um, I need you to get out of your papers that we were working on. Oh, I'm sorry. On yesterday and start on problem number seven. Problem number seven. Caleb, look, you almost were finished with this yesterday. I want you to start here on number seven. You know how to do these problems. It's just like number six from yesterday. So can you go ahead and get started? I need you to make a good choice. I mean, I'm not in the mood today. I can see that you're not in the mood, Caleb, but I really need you to get this assignment finished, okay? Make a good choice. You need to pass this class. Well, you know, Mr. Carson, give me detention for nothing. I can see that you're upset and with Mr. Carson, and you and I can talk about that detention later, okay? But right now, it's important to focus on math and get this problem done. Keisha, nice job. Great choice, Caleb. Nice job. Okay. So, yep, she kept it low key, redirecting him. Right. She attended to other students and made sure they kept working and didn't make it the whole class this time. Right. Just an individual with him followed up with praise, spoke to him in a very respectful way, keeping the task demand and expectation in place, um, but allowing him an outlet and showing empathy. Yeah, exactly. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much for those ideas. Um, I do want to show you this. This is um, a document that you have access to, and it is on the website where the PowerPoint presentation is located. And it is a guide that just has links and QR codes to all of these videos um, for your use if you want to use them to prompt discussion um, with your own um, faculty. Okay. All right. Sorry. Sorry, Caleb. Um, okay. Now, sometimes we get to that first situation um, with Caleb where that behavior comes to a peak, right? He's, he's pushing his chair, he's, um, uh, he's uh, 
decided that that is it, right? And he has to he has to leave the classroom. There are also times um, where that actually was a pretty calm, <laughs> a pretty calm behavior um, for him. But lots of times where um, kids are uh, are putting or could potentially be putting other kids at risk, right? So they're tearing up your classroom, they're ripping things, they're throwing things, they're pushing furniture. When it gets to that place, what you want to be thinking about is not intervention because you're not going to be like, how could you make a better choice during that time, right? They are in crisis. You want to make sure that they are safe, that you are calm, and that all the other students in your classroom are safe. So many times this is um, when we would use a room clearing procedure that we had practiced and learned prior. So all of the other students would leave the classroom on your signal. They would file out quietly. Then you would maintain the connection with that student. Um, usually there's physical distance. They, you know, they're kind of watching you. I used to pull a book out or something to do and kind of sit there quietly until they started to calm down and enter that next phase. But this again is a time where you're kind of moving things out of the way that might hurt them and certainly protecting other kids. What's really important is that the other kids know that you will take care of the child in crisis and that they will be safe because sometimes we forget about the students when they're observing this um, and how hard and traumatic it can be for them as well. This is when I pull out what I call my ED voice, where we get calmer, we talk slower in a lower voice. If we are escalating at the pace of students, then we are going to be matching them. They are going to um, continue. So again, calm. If you have, um, I used to tell my students after the first time this happens, you need to have a plan in place. And then I was like, okay, maybe that's too high of a bar. So at least after the second time, but after this happens once, you want to be having conversations with families, with other people um, in your building. You need to be creating um, specific individualized plans for students um, so that safety can happen and that students can um, be learning new skills to do this differently in the next time. All right, then we're at de-escalation. And when we get to the de-escalation phase, again, this isn't really the time that we're gonna be intervening, right? But what we're gonna see students doing is there's gonna be some confusion. When you get to peak behavior, it's very disorienting, right? It's emotionally and physically draining for kids. And so we really wanna think about um, the kinds of behaviors that they that we would anticipate that them uh, showing, right? So these are not bad things. These are natural ways that you come out of some sort of crisis behavior. They might be blaming somebody else for what's going on, right? They're trying to, to process this. And also they're trying to recover. It's embarrassing um, to lose this kind of, uh, to lose control like that. So again, we're still maintaining um, safety here. We are not engaging in, when they're starting to blame others, we're not engaging in, oh, you know, this is not their fault, it's your fault, blah, 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 any of those things. We really don't want to be engaging with them. Again, a calm, safe space for them um, to recover. And it's a good idea to have something that you can give them to engage in. It might be a favorite book. It might be, um, you know, an activity that you know that they can do and have success with. So they actually are starting um, to re-engage. All right, now finally, stage seven, we're in recovery. So during recovery is when they're ready to get back on track, they wanna rejoin the group, um, and they could still be a little bit defensive about their behavior, especially if peers are mentioning that, or they might try to kind of um, avoid the situation. But we wanna make sure that we're following through with whatever the consequence was for that, but we also want to engage the other kids, get them back in class, get re get instruction moving forward, and then making sure we're watching for when they're trying to do that right thing. So that's like the Caleb picking up the paper, really recognizing when kids are trying to meet the expectation again, and then really welcoming them back um, uh, to the classroom and getting them quickly reengaged in the routine. Okay, and then and then finally, then we do have that debriefing session. So we do want to make sure that we're 
you know, reinforcing um, the expectations and the goals, how they might do things differently, walking in the, through the steps of problem solving, reminding them of all, all of those strategies that they have, including some of the ones that Kathleen is going to share with you in just a minute. So what I wanted to show you is just that all of those things, this is a template for you to use to think about what those behaviors look like for each of your particular students that you're trying to support. And then what are the strategies at each phase of that so that teachers and adults and anyone working with them can intervene as early as possible. But if we miss the opportunity, then what do we do to help them recover from that and re-engage in learning? So we have both a template and a sample for you to use on the website. And again, this is there if you um, have an intervention grid or want to share this. Important just to really hone in on that point that she made about it is an adult's first response. It's going to be the driver of whether or not that kid really amps up or if things can calm down. And timing is so, so important. In addition to teaching everybody back in your building and in your world that, you know, behavior, although sometimes it might feel like it's coming out of nowhere, it actually, there is a cycle to it. And the idea would be to get in front of it and empower all the teachers and everybody that's interacting with kids, including substitutes, including family volunteer members, to make sure that they have those low intensity strategies that they can use at well-timed places. And one of the groups I got to go to, we also talked about not doing certain things like offering choices or trying to pre-correct when a kid's already really escalated. As Wendy mentioned, that's the time to clear the room, keep everybody safe. Kids are not receptive to instruction at this time. So we hope you found that piece useful. And as Grant mentioned, when he was kind of setting the stage for where we're having these conversations, it would be less effective to work on all this stuff with kids with intensive intervention needs if there isn't a base experience in your school. So, you know, Nikki Minaj was right. You know, we got we to gotta build the base. We got to have that super base to make sure that everybody has clarity on what the expectations are. Every adult in the building knows how to weave in those social, emotional, well-being skill sets that you're teaching, things like empathy, because these are create positive, productive atmospheres that allow you to build those relationships, which I also saw in the chat was a key theme. What we're going to do right now in this next se segment is we're going to shift gears. And now we're going to think about kids with internalizing issues. All right. So thinking about kids with internalizing issues, as we jump into that, I want to make one point um, clear is that we can't bucket kids to say you either have just externalizing or just internalizing. And when we think about those co-occurring behavior challenges, oftentimes kids experience both. And what often shows up is the acting out behavior and those outward directed things that many kids actually have co-occurring internalizing issues as well. And I can think about these as being really over-controlled behaviors. And it's things like, um, you know, somatic complaints and feeling anxious. Um, these symptoms that you're looking at here right now, there's a whole huge range of internalizing issues. And today we're going to focus on anxious feelings as the main one. And I want to say that a lot of times people think, okay, what does this really have to do with me? I'm a teacher. I'm going to go in and I'm going to crush it in terms of, you know, empowering kids academically. There are decades of research to show that when kids have internalizing issues, it impedes their experience at school in terms of how they interact with adults, how they interact with their peers. And it also impedes um, oftentimes their engagement in academic instruction. And so when you think about this group of kids this might be a bigger group of kids than you actually think about. Uh, if you were to take a picture right now, as Wendy mentioned at the very beginning, about pre-pandemic, you could have expected about 20% of all school-age youth to have between mild to severe challenges. And the National Association of School Psychologists has anticipated that that is, is going up even more so. And when I look at some of these um, stats that I'm giving to you right now, like 40% of kids that also have externalizing behavior patterns also have internalizing, that's important for us to keep in mind because we want to build interventions and respond in a way that dresses both in that integrated way that, um, that uh, Grant was talking about. I also find it striking that about one third of all of us in the world have experienced some type of anxious 
feelings or anxiety disorder sometime during adolescence. It's a complicated time period. So it's not something that just affects older kids or younger kids. It is across the, um, it is across the span. So when we think about supporting kids with internalizing issues, I also want to say you've got really, really good news. If you are at a school that has like a comprehensive integrated three-tiered model of prevention, like with positive behavior interventions at the heart, you already have things in place at tier one that are healthy for preventing the development of internalizing behavior problems and responding more effectively when things happen. So the good news is we can we can use well-placed antecedent adjustments like Wendy was talking about, like we can set the stage for positive and productive learning environments by having expectations, by pre-correcting kids to look for the things that tell them ahead of time what you're looking for, and then doing acknowledgements. And acknowledgements like with your universal reinforcement ticket system. And so that is actually helpful for shaping behavior of all students, not just to make problem behaviors go away, but also to maximize engagement. So the good news is, is that kids with internalizing issues from preschool to high school, they respond well to that clear expectations, positive learning environments with those acknowledgements. And many of you have probably also heard of check-in, check-out as a tier two intervention that some of you have done. And we know that that is also very effective for kids with internalizing issues. Allison, who's one of our coaches on this call, she's actually doing a systematic review of the literature right now to see how that specific intervention works for these kids in particular. And I also want to make you aware that there's also more intensive interventions, and we're going to talk about these in just a couple minutes, some of which that you won't ever do as an educator, like cognitive behavior therapy is something that is done by trained professionals that is really effective for managing internalizing issues. And you wouldn't be expected to do that yourself, but you want to know about what's happening so that it takes the mystery out of what's happening in a tier three intervention that might be provided by a school psychologist or somebody from a community agency. But as we think about the work that we're doing together right now today, Anxiety disorders show up in a range of ways, but regardless of their DSM, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Health, like right, regardless of their specific diagnosis, many of the symptoms, like how it shows up in our classrooms, is very, very common. So it kind of the common thread is this excessive or, or rational fear of worry. And I think many of us, and I'm not going to ask you to identify yourself unless you want to in the chat, but I think many of us struggle with those things at different stages and phases and in different contexts. So what does it look like in kids? It's this feeling of being very easily overwhelmed, this really hardcore pressing sense of dread. For some kids that shows up is very, very obsessive or intrusive thoughts. And it's not like schizophrenia thoughts, but it's just like repeated patterns of negative self-talk in their mind. And it shows up sometimes too in terms of physical responses like stomach aches. I have to go to the bathroom all the time. I'm having trouble breathing. I can't get a deep breath, depending on what it looks like. And some kids can even have panic attacks. And for many kids, it's also can be a symptom of depression. And I'm going to invite you for just a moment to think about a child in your world that you, it could be somebody that you know, either in your role as an educator or somebody in your personal life that might have these types of behavioral manifestations of anxious feelings. And I will say, I'm also happy to say that in addition to being able to have um, funds for the Institute of Education Sciences that allow us to be with you to here tonight, we also have another project that's taking place right now. And in that project, we're actually working with kids um, in grades three, four, and five to test out a new strategy um, that will be available one year from today. <laughs> It'll be available and it's called Recognize, Relax, and Record. And it's a fully manual tier two intervention that is, we hope, very practical for a classroom teachers to do. So stay tuned to think more about that. But when you think about anxious feelings right now, how does it show up? It shows up with those behavior manifestations we just talked about. It also makes it, not surprisingly, very hard to suit up, show up, and enjoy school. It makes it hard for kids to feel comfortable in their interactions with adults, with their peers. And when you think about it, like if something is really pressing on your mind, 
some kind of an anxious feeling, it makes it really hard to engage in the immediate thing. And so you often might hear as adults, like people at the beginning of professional learning sessions or at the beginning of a day say, I invite you all to be fully present. I came out of another meeting today that was a two hour professional learning on Zoom. And that's how they started the whole thing. We know you've got lots going on in your life. We're going to invite you to you know focus in on these things. And if we don't, we know that without good support, kids that are experiencing internalizing issues it can impede their overall academic learning experiences. And Wendy and I have done studies for a number of years, along with many people on this call right now, that have actually shown that fall internalizing scores, like if you're somebody that does systematic screenings, the, like if you do those universal screenings, those fall scores for kids with internalizing behavior patterns, it actually predicts not only behavior challenges, but it predicts lower oral reading fluency scores, lower math scores, and it predicts a, a greater number of course failures and lower grade point averages for middle and high school kids. It does impact their academic experience. So what we're going to talk about right now is how we can address this across the tiers. So we're going to talk a little bit about what can be done like relaxation training, and that could be done for all, for some, or for a few. Then we're going to talk about self-monitoring as a tier two intervention. Then we're going to talk about cognitive restructuring can, that can be shown up first as a tier two and then as a tier three. And then we're going to conclude with something that is near and dear to Elisa's heart, which is functional assessment-based interventions. So when you think about all these different interventions, we want to have some that are designed to prevent challenges from occurring. Your tiered system, the base of what you've built, whether it's a CI3T tier or if it's a straight PBS tier, there's things at tier one, like teaching kids strategies that they can use to maintain calm and know what their body feels like. You've probably seen those, like helping kids to become self-aware, to self-regulate, to use strategies such as, you know, pattern breathing, positive self-talk, guided imagery, all those types of things, progressive muscle relaxations. Ideally, those are things that can be done for all kids. I remember when I, I've been both a middle school teacher and an elementary teacher. And I remember as an elementary teacher, every day when kids came back from uh, lunchtime, when things are usually pretty popping, I would start with something. Thank you for smiling, Stacy. Um, when they came back from lunch, I would do a guided relaxation activity. So they'd come in. And for those of you, and this is totally going to date me, but I'm proud of it. Um, so you guys might re remember Vanilla Ice back in the day. So that's the song I brought them back into from recess. And when that song was over, then I had them all sit in their chair. Then we did a guided relaxation. I wanted to create a joyful moment to bring them back. And then I wanted to do something to take it down to the next level. That makes sense? And then still, even with that in place, there's going to be other things like, and kids are going to need more than tier one has to offer. And you've heard our team talk many times about that is not a tragedy. It's not a sign of a bad teacher or a bad school. That is 100% an expectation. So one of the things that I want to show you right now is I want to talk to you about the idea of relaxation strategies. And I think many of you probably do these in your own life. Like some of you might like uh, subscribe to the Calm app, or I always call it the Calm Lady. My husband always says, you got a thing going with the Calm Lady, because I'm like, you know, like, like listening to that little 10 minute guided meditation at the end of the day. Um, if you would, in the chat right now, is there any kind of strategy that you use to teach to kids right now or use yourself? Like pattern breathing of, you know, four in, four, four out, or box breathing, or do you do the breathing of breathe in, breathe out, good, excellent. Restorative practices are right up there too. How many of you do guided imagery where you take yourself mentally to some place that brings you joy, that creates calmness for you? How many of you have tried things like progressive relaxation for your body, like where you tense up and then calm different parts? How many of you have used something like positive self-talk? where you replace negative thought patterns with more positive ones. Wonderful. So as we are thinking about these, there's a wonderful researcher and good friend of Wendy and mine. Her name is uh, Kimberly Venist, and she has done some excellent research on these specific strategies for anxiety. And here is the big idea behind these strategies. The first thing is help 
you help kids to figure out when are you most likely to feel anxious. And you might identify that for yourself as well. I was telling in a small group, one of the teachers that we're working with right now, she shared with her whole class, I'm feeling really anxious about my evaluation coming up. And it's, you know, my principal's coming in in about an hour. Let's all do some box breathing together. I thought that was so cool that she's teaching it in a small group and then modeling how to do it. So what is the context that makes you anxious? Is it public speaking? Is it going out for recess? Is it having to eat in the cafeteria? Is it getting ready for state assessments? And then we want to provide options for teaching relaxation strategies that are based on the student's strengths and areas of, of, of interest. And so choice in the use of strategy, I would marry that low intensity support of choice with these strategies so that it's like, here's like four things you could do. You could do breathing, you could do positive self-talk, progressive muscle relaxation, you could do guided imagery, which ones make the most sense for you? And maybe you start with the first one, like pattern breathing, because it's the simplest and you would incorporate that into others. And then once they've made those selections, then you go deep and we teach them those procedures. But the idea is change the physiological state, taking a deep breath, taking an opportunity to slow down your thinking and process those things. And why is that important? That when people get in that heightened state, you can get really, really anxious. And that's tough. Um, I know um, it, oftentimes I will, like, people will tell me, get out of the fountain, Kathleen. Because, um, and Wendy's laughing at this because she's heard this for years. So I, 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 I completely understand where kids are in a spot like, oh my gosh, if I, if I don't do well on this test, I'm going to get embarrassed. People are going to know I didn't do well. If I don't do well, I'm not going to go back to school. And then if I don't go back to school, then I'm going to wind up dropping out. And if I drop out, I'm not going to have a place to live. And if I'm homeless, I'm not going to have any place to eat. And I'm not going to have a place to shower. And I don't have to shower in a fountain. And all of a sudden, this kid who's getting ready just to take this exam is showering in a fountain somewhere. So we always say, let's get out of the fountain and let's right size what this problem is looking like. So what I would like to do right now is invite Rebecca to please share with us on her computer. We're going to just do just about a 60 seconds of this guided relaxation protocol together. And you have this audio file if you'd like to try this together. Thanks, Aunt Beck. Yeah, let me know if you cannot hear this. We're going to begin the steps in relaxation training. Take a deep breath in. Hold it for about 10 seconds. Hold it. Okay, let it out. Raise both your hands about halfway above your seat. Breathe normally. Now drop your hands. Now hold your arms out about halfway and make tight fists, really tight. Feel the tension in your hands. I'm going to count to three, and when I say three, I want you to drop your hands. One, two, three. Now raise your arms again. Bend your fingers back the other way toward your body. Now drop your hands and relax. Now raise your arms. Now drop them and relax. So that is something relaxation training. If I was in a classroom today, whether it was preschool, elementary, middle, or high school, I would build that into a routine on a predictable way to help kids to know what it feel like, feels like to be calm, because many kids honestly have forgotten, and it's a great skill, and it can be incorporated into Tier 2 and Tier 3 supports. In addition to something like that that we can do for everybody, there's also Tier 2 interventions that are very much validated, and I know some of you are here tonight as board-certified behavior analysts. And we know that like self-monitoring is an intervention that works in a very integrated way. Like self-monitoring can be good for increasing work productivity, decreasing disruption, increasing engagement. And it can be a way for students that have internalizing issues to not only use these strategies, they can monitor the use of these strategies and then they can see how they're feeling in terms of their own engagement. So for example, if I'm feeling anxious, 
I can use these strategies and then ask myself the question when I'm using these strategies, does it help me to be present and engaged in that moment? So if you're thinking, oh my gosh, that makes sense. Good news is you can go back to that same page on the website that we've been showing you. When you go down to this bar, <clears throat> you can open it up and there's one option if you want. You can download in, in one click, download everything that you would need to set up this self-monitoring intervention. And there's forms that are more age appropriate for younger kids. And there's some that are more age appropriate for middle school kids. But for those of you who are like thinking intervention minded right now, there's a little checklist for getting started. There's a little template to go through to make a plan with families. And I would remind you that you're doing this with families, not for them, because they are their children, our students. And so ideally, we could work together in getting those in place. And it's also important to ask kids what they feel comfortable with. So like if a kid tells you, like, I'd be low key embarrassed to have this out on my desk, then maybe your self-monitoring form goes inside of a, no a notebook so that it could be more private for the child. But that's a very effective intervention. And again, that's on the professional learning tab under self-monitoring. For those of you that are in a CI3T school, one of the things that we do to facilitate uh, transparency and communication is that we make it clear this is what we mean by this support. Here's a description of it. And then people use their own school-wide data to ensure equitable access to these extra supports. Not every child has a family that knows how to negotiate the school scene. So we want to make sure that we're checking three times a year. And then anytime that we do something extra for a student, we want to make sure that we're keeping track of is it happening as planned? That's your treatment integrity. What do people think about it before they start in terms of the goals, the procedures, and the outcome, which is social validity. And then, of course, uh, knowing how it's impacting kids. And sometimes this is going to be enough. And self-monitoring is one of those interventions where you're not going to want to take that away. Ideally, you might fade the use of the form or something, but we want kids to continue to self-evaluate self how they're doing. In addition, you're going to have tier three supports. And I want to be very clear one more time. We're not suggesting that you leave here tonight to go do cognitive behavior therapy with your kids. <laughs> Our goal for you tonight is to know that this is a viable option. And so as we think about what to do to support kids, cognitive behavior therapy helps us to get in touch with what are the students' thoughts that lead to specific feelings that then lead to specific behaviors. And so this would be done by somebody with excellent training. There's many different facets to um, cognitive behavior therapy. Um, some of which are cognitive restructuring, which we're going to talk about in a minute, as well as like relaxation strategies that we talked about. There's also pieces of it, like where you're doing scheduled activities. You could train professional can do things like systematic desensitization. But some of the benefits of coordinating these supports is that we want to take the mystery out of what's happening in a tier three intervention. So in, in your CI3T implementation manual, if you have one, you want to make sure that that tier two or tier three intervention grid in this case is clear as to what's happening so that a teacher, like if they have a child, like if I'm in Stacy's class and she knows I'm getting... CBT, she needs to know what's happening, not the details of the conversation, but the strategy so that she can support me in using those during my regularly scheduled activities as a high school student, a middle school student, or elementary age student. And we can make those connections across the, the tier. So we can remind kids like, oh, this would be a good time to maybe apply that. Or I can see you're feeling a little bit anxious. What would be a good strategy for you to use? Like you can prompt the use of those strategies. One of the things that I think um, you might see more often as a teacher is the use of cognitive restructuring, which is you're taking and identifying first kind of erroneous thoughts or beliefs, like everybody's going to hate me if I make this mistake, or if I show up late to school, I'm going to be humiliated by my teacher. And we want to help kids to constructively challenge the reality of those thoughts or beliefs, and we want to reframe those negative thoughts into something more difficult or more manageable. So we basically want to teach students to identify irrational thoughts and replace them with things that are more rational. And so part of that is doing an appraisal of the situation. So some of these strategies might be things like decatastrophizing. So walk it all the way out. What, okay, what's really, what, what has happened in the past? Like if you drop your tray in the cafeteria, I know it might feel anxious to go back in there, but Really, was it everybody laughing? Did anybody come to help you? You're replaying those things. We also want to make sure that you can relabel things like that. Um, so like if somebody's heading into a stressful situation, instead of them feeling like, oh my God, this is going to be miserable. I'm going to hate every minute of this. I know I'm going to be the last person picked for this team. Instead, 
it could be like, you know what, I might be the last person to pick, but this is going to be a, give me a great opportunity to get better at this sport. The more I play, the better I'm going to get at it. Or maybe doing some reattribution training. Like, you know, I didn't do very well on that test. It's not because I'm a bad student. It's probably because I didn't spend enough time studying the right thing. So next time I'm going to ask this teacher to help me to figure out how to best focus my study efforts. But we want to help kids to figure out which strategies make the most sense for them. And again, this would be an example of a tier three support that you can use for students. I also want to say you probably have access to some resources like these where you can partner with families to develop more comprehensive interventions. So instead of the kid showering in the fountain, instead it could be the possibility of saying, Let's reframe that story. Let's retell that story in a more constructive way. Like, I might not do well on this test, and if I don't, then here's my plan. Or I did these things that are going to help me to do well. And actually plan it all the way out, doing things like, what's the worst case scenario? And I like to do this a lot, and I'm sure I drive my husband nuts with this. But I always say, okay, worst case scenario, the car won't start. Or if we run out of gas before we get to the sketch and you can come up with a plan. It was encouraging to me to see how much of these things are already on your radar. Um, as you're thinking about what you took away tonight, and Wendy, I just want to compliment you. This was such a well-planned session, so thank you for leading this. And I think you've hopefully seen some tools and some resources that can help support kids that struggle with acting out issues and hopefully putting some new understanding about supporting kids with internalizing issues that it's not just a tier three issue, that that's things that we can weave all across the tiers. And hopefully that idea of integration that we want to make sure that when we talk about working in a CI3T system to meet students' multiple needs, we want to deal with the whole child. So if it's a student showing up, they might have some acting out issues that are coupled with internalizing issues. And they might have some real strengths in terms of like mathematics skills and struggle in the area of reading. But whatever their situation is, we want to make sure that we have the tools and resources to do that. And as you're, as you're leaving tonight with additional resources as we wrap up, I also want to mention um, that at the very beginning, I talked about Elise Saracen's passion, which is also shared by Eric and David and Wendy and others, is this idea of functional assessment-based interventions. There's a whole separate tab on our website that goes through all the things that you would need to know to better understand the why of challenge, the challenging behavior that's happening, how to define it, how to communicate it, how to figure out what's maintaining it, and then build an intervention to teach students more efficient and effective ways to get their needs met in a way that creates a positive learning environment. And so as you are thinking about having further conversations and chatting with others, I'm hopeful that you might be able to pull some uh, out of the, some of these slides out to go take back to facilitate conversations with others. And if you choose to, as we wrap up tonight, I want to remind you what Wendy mentioned at the very beginning is that we do have one more session. It's on April 22nd, or excuse me, April 23rd, and we'll be wrapping up this academic year and we'll be talking about strategies to successfully close out the year. And that is the same session where we are going to release the dates and times and registration links for all the Empower stuff for next year. And next year, as uh, was also mentioned earlier, on 6-24-2024. Let's write that down. 6-24-2024. So this June, you're going to have a whole new bank of resources that we're excited to introduce you to um, early in the fall.